In the Gospel of Mark in chapter number five, actually the the Gospel of Mark is one of my favorite chapters in all the scriptures, uh, mainly just because something happened one time and um, I was in a particularly, I was just having a bad week and as I read it, God spoke to my heart and from the last half, now we're going to be reading the first half today, but from the last half of the chapter, God spoke, spoke to my heart in such a profound way that he kind of gave me a a signature message from it. It, Outside of preaching the gospel, probably no other message more important than the one I preach from the last half of Mark chapter number five. But we'll be in the first half of Mark chapter number five this morning. And it says, And they came over to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately... There met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, He was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he had said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh under the mountain a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see, uh, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. I want to preach on this thought today, when God has to do it. When God has to do it. We face problems in our life, we face struggles, and sometimes we can handle it. Sometimes God has to do it, or it won't get done. Father, we love you, we thank you for the day, and Lord, I just pray that you'd bless this reading and preaching of your word in Jesus' name, with thanksgiving, amen and amen, and you can be seated. There are things that we can usually handle. Um, I remember... When my mama wanted to quit smoking, she tried to quit smoking. Mama would smoke between three and four packs a day, a cool filter king, the the menthol kind, green pack. And uh, come from a family of smokers. I remember as a little kid, this will take you back, we had a note under the cash register, under the change drawer. So if there was a new employee down at the L&M, and I'd walk down, I'd be like, I need to get three cartons of Cool Filter King, two cartons of L&M Red, and one carton of Marlboro 100s. Not the light 100s, the long ones, the gold pack. And they're like, you can't buy cigarettes. I was like, no, right under the drawer, under the change. If you lift that up, uh, you'll see a note from my mom. Had a note from my mom at the L&M grocery store. I got to drive when I was 13. I knew how to drive. I'd 
Started driving when I was 11, learning at, at the church parking lot next door when we were homeless, living with Granny. And there was a church parking lot, my mom, while she was outside doing our eternal garage sale, summer long garage sale. We were running a flea market in Grandma's front yard is what we were doing. <clears throat> trying to sell enough of our stuff to get a deposit for some place to live. And I could go out in that parking lot and drive. I wasn't allowed to touch the accelerator, but I could work the brake and the shifter. And I'd pull into parking spots and I'd pull out of parking spots. I learned how to park. I learned how to parallel park. I taught myself to, to drive and to move around. And, and uh, my mom was very impressed by that. And one day, it was like one of those mid-July, late July, early August days. And... Uh, <clears throat> Mom's like, David, run down and get cigarettes. I was like, Mom, it's 106 degrees. Can I go tonight? She's like, baby, I need a cigarette right now. And I said, can I drive? She said, you're 13. And I said, I know how to drive, Mom. She said, uh, no. I said, it's 106, Mom. It's too hot. I said, I always ride up there and get it. But I said, I could just go in the car. Of course, it's like 150 in the car. We were not interested in facts. I just wanted to drive. So, man, finally she relented, and I got in the car all by myself, first time. I got to use the accelerator. Man, I went out and went down the street. I pulled up in a car, 13, by myself. And I wasn't tall. I was a short, fat kid until I was a tall, fat kid. And uh, so here's a short kid pulling up, throwing the car in park, get out, and, and it was a new cashier. Looking at me like, what is going on? I walk in, it's like, I need six cartons of cigarettes. I need this, this. Started laying it all out, man. And I was like, no, I got a note from my mom. They're like, how old are you? I was like, it's okay. You know, I, I, I didn't want to tell them I was 13 driving down the road. And, uh, but I remember when mom really, really got serious about quitting. She actually got sick. She had pneumonia. And she was like, David, bring me a cigarette. I said, mama, you can't breathe. She was, she was wheezing. He said, I need a cigarette, I need a cigarette. Man, I, I went over there and I got the cigarette out and I put it in her hand and I lit it for her. And man, mama inhaled. And I've never seen anybody turn green before. Mama turned green. She literally could not breathe. And mama never smoked another cigarette for the rest of her life. That's a big deal. And uh, she told me there was a carton, a fresh carton right there. And she said, if I never open that carton, I'll never smoke again. I remember one time, man, my parents were getting in a big fight, and she had just put it up on top of the refrigerator. Mom walked over to the refrigerator. She reached up there, could barely get it. She, she got that carton down. She stuck her finger in there. She was mad, man. And she said, no, nah, you ain't going to kill me. And she just you know, went back to fighting. She never opened that carton of cigarettes. I don't even know what became of it. And... Uh, <clears throat> Sometimes we can do it. You know, it's like dieting. We can do it. I can lay out five good diets for you. I know how to diet. But it's hard. It's hard sometimes to get that done. Sometimes it's hard to quit. You know, do it. Somebody says, well, don't you hate being fat? It's like, I guess. I don't know. I've never been anything else. I've always been fat. So I don't know, I guess I hate being fat, but not as much as I hate doing without tacos. I, I don't know. Um, and I'm, I'm down. I mean, I don't look down, but I'm down. And I'm stuck. I've been stuck for a year now. A year. And, uh, and it's hard. It's hard going to that next step. And so I, I haven't, like, besought the Lord and asked him to do a miracle and you know, wake up tomorrow and I have to go buy new clothes. I haven't asked the Lord for that. I, I feel like this is something I need to do. And so, you know, I, I stay on my intermittent fasting and all that. And I've been holding steady. I've lost 95 pounds. And, uh, and so, but I'm holding right there. And I mean, I just, uh, it makes me crazy. And, uh, but I, my problem is I snack sometimes or all the time I snack. And, but you know, there are problems in our life that are not self-controlled. They're not, they're not based on self-control. There are things that happen in our lives that are out of our control, and they're just too big. And if those problems are going to get solved, friend, the Lord is going to have to do it. As we read that, I hope you were paying attention. 
it said he had a devil. And the devil certainly knew who Jesus was. He knew he was the son of God. He knew he had the power to hurt him. And then when Jesus asked him, he says, what's your name? He says, Legion, for we are many. And I don't know if every one of the hogs got a demon. I don't know if every one of them, but all of them ran. It said about 2,000. Can you imagine live, trying to live your life with potentially 2,000 demons living inside you? It said, this guy's away from his family. He's not sleeping. Day and night, he's crying out and he's doing self-harm. Cutting himself with stones. And this is out of control. People have tried to put him in things. I mean, listen, some problems are just bigger than we are. And, and I'm a fixer. So I, I, I like to solve problems. Sometimes people come and like, preacher, I have a problem. And I love it when they'll just lay out clearly the facts, what they are. And then listen, when I give you the solution, I don't want you to make a bunch of excuses. Making excuses is how we get in our failures anyway. Say amen right there. Uh, making excuses is how we get caught up in sin. Making excuses is how we let our kids go to hell. Making excuses is, is how we stop serving the Lord. So when people come and they have a problem, I'm like, just give me the facts. I don't need your opinion. I don't need your excuses. Tell me what's wrong and pff, let's fix it. Let's pray about it and let's fix it. I love fixing stuff. Some things are too big. Even in my own life, there are things that are just way beyond my pay grade. I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't, can't do it. You have an unclean spirit. He's out of control. He has got supernatural strength. In verse 4, it says chains, fetters. They are trying to tie this guy up with chains, and he's just breaking them, man. Fetters is what they'd use in prison, and they'd, they'd put them on their feet, and he's breaking them into pieces. I mean, therapy is not going to help this guy. Jail isn't going to help him. Medication isn't going to help him. Jesus is what he needed. Amen. Again, in verse 5, you see the self-harm. And then in verse number 6, when he sees Jesus, he came and worshipped him. Do you know even the, the, the one-third of the evil angels out of heaven, they still know who Jesus is? And by the way, people are like, oh, that was weird how they had evil spirits back then. Where do you reckon they went? So they got cast out of heaven some 4,000 years before Jesus. And you read the Gospels, and they're full of unclean spirits. So they were there 4,000 years. Think about the wickedness in our world today. You don't think they're still evil spirits? But you'll see people trying to medicate them away, trying to therapy them away, trying to diagnose them away. There's a lot of problems that some people have. And they think they need to be rehabilitated. Now what they need to have is Jesus. Amen. Now I'm not saying chemicals in your body cannot get out of sorts. And when they do blood work, they can see that. And sometimes you need some medication to help you get right. A lot of times it's vitamin deficiencies. Sometimes if we just, if we ate the right kind of diet, most of our problems be gone. Uh, the world would not be uh, wearing, wearing masks and worrying about the coronavirus. The world wouldn't freak out every year at flu season if we all had the kind of diets and we were all 100% healthy like we should be. But because we don't, we got, you know, we wake up every morning and shake our morning maraca and take the medicine out and take our, take our pills because we don't have the right kind of diets. We don't have the right kind of health. We don't have the right kind of uh, vitamins. So listen, it's, I encourage you to take some supplements. A lot of times people will come there, God, I just don't know what's going on. And preacher, it's this and this, and I'm having all these problems. A lot of times I'll just say, when was the last time you went to your doctor? When was the last time you had some blood work? 
You, you may be low on vitamin D. You may be low on vitamin B. You may be low on potassium. You may have some real problems. You might be low on iron. You know, I mean, there's vitamin deficiencies will cause you to act, think, perform, live differently. And, and so if you're having a weird problem, you're like, I just don't understand. It's, it's not a bad thing to go see your doctor and just ask him if he could run a blood panel just to see where you're at. You may need some... Uh, you just may need some vitamins. You may, you know, you may, you, you may need to change the way you're eating. You may need to change some stuff. And, uh, but here, we know the problem, the problem that he has, he's got an evil spirit. And apparently a ton of demons living inside him. You get to verse 7, and listen, I, this is important to me. To think about. When I read this, I thought, wow, there it is. Here's this problem that was unmanageable by this guy. This maniac of Gadara. The problem is not that he's a maniac. The problem was he was possessed. But his problem was afraid of Jesus. Look at verse 7. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. The Lord can make your problems miserable. The Lord can make your problems go away. Verses 8 and 9, it's demonic. He says, For, come out, for he had said, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And then he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, a lot of times, people don't believe in unclean spirits. People today, Americans primarily. <clears throat> you go to Brazil, get away from the big city, everybody believes in unclean spirits. Go south of the border. Get outside of Mexico City, the largest city in the world. Get, get out in, in, in the Yucatan somewhere. Get out in the jungles or in the small villages. And everybody believes in unclean spirits. A missionary friend of mine the other day on fr uh, Friday, he was preaching in chapel out at the seminary. And, um, and he was talking about how some things that he had seen. Talk to our missionaries that, that come from Papua New Guinea. Talk to missionaries that live away. Now, I don't know what the cause is. I don't know why we don't see or why we ignore. Majors not even need any unclean spirits around here. We have TV. We got television. But there are things, there are people in faraway places that see things. I met a guy in Mexico. He could see color. I'm, he could see color. That's great. Preach, that's deep. You know, he could see sound. He saw sound. And I asked him, I said, man, how did you learn how to play the guitar like that? He goes, I see it. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, ring. He goes, I see that. That's green. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm trying to break off my Spanglish to him. And, and he explains to me that when he hears a musical note, he sees it as color. So he's like, red, red, green, red, 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 green, blue, red. And he sees that as different colors. And he just learned how to make the colors. So even as a very young person, without professional lessons, he learned how to play the guitar. He taught himself how to play the guitar, just visually watching for the colors. And he can and just play anything. It's unbelievable. Now, a lot of people see that kind of stuff, and it makes them go crazy. And I'm not saying he might not have been a little crazy. But we, uh, there are people that see things that we don't see on the light spectrum. You have sound waves, we don't see those. But when you get into light waves, we see those. They're on the visual spectrum. There's microwaves, we don't see those. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of waves. So here in, in the big city, we have... So many, satellite, TV, cell phones now, just millions and millions of cell phones, 
banging off of towers everywhere, all the different dish network, cable TV, interwebs, Wi-Fi's, all these signals flying all around. I don't know if that keeps us from seeing things that other people don't see, but I know when you get away from the big city, when you're in a less populated area, for some reason, people see things that they, they will swear are absolutely real. I've heard stories that I, I just don't doubt. And here's the deal. We have the Bible. It says those evil spirits are there all around. So where do you think they went? I think they're still here. And sometimes what we do is people that are seeing those things, we give them medication. A lot of people who see those things all the time, uh, op opioid Opioid addicts see tons of stuff. Uh, people who take hallucinogens. I don't know if it just alters their, their vision. The prophet asked God, he said, this young man, show him what's going on. Because the man said, greater, greater are they that are with us than they that are in the world. And the guy's like, I have no idea what you're saying. We're, we are outnumbered. And he's like, no, Lord, show him. And all of a sudden, the Lord altered his vision and he could see into the spirit world. And when he saw in the spirit world, he saw horses and chariots and all this stuff going on. And it was a very frightening moment, very sobering moment to him. But it gave him confidence because he realized what was going on. I don't know if people that are on opiates and things, if they're seeing just into the spirit world or what. But I know that, that it's enough to make some of them go mad. And it takes medication to get their brains to quit doing that. And so it's very strange, but I believe in the spirit world. I believe absolutely that there are things going on around us that we cannot see. Amen. In the Bible, they believed. In the New Testament, they believed. When Peter, when God supernaturally got him out of prison, he went up and knocked on the door. A little maiden, he's like, let me in. A little maiden went to the door and said, <laughs> nope, and closed the door. She went back, they said, who's at the door? They go, it's Peter's ghost. And they were like, what? Let's go see. And it was Peter. It wasn't his ghost. But they were just like, nope, it's Peter's ghost. They believed in it. They dealt with it. Jesus gave the disciples power over disease and over all spirits. But they could not cast out all because of a lack of faith. So I, I believe. I'm just a Bible believer. I believe everything in the Bible is literal unless it's obvious that it's you know, a picture of something. So some problems are too big for us and some solutions are radical. Some solutions are radical. In verses 10 through 13, you see that's where Jesus sends them into the swine and the swine went, listen guys, that was radical. And by the way, the problem didn't like the solution. Choked out and drowned in the sea, 2,000. I mean, that's big hogicide. That's hogicide on a big level. And they went down there. I mean, that was unbelievable. Some solutions are radical. And sometimes we have to make some new, some major changes in our life. Sometimes when the Lord has to step in on a big problem, the solution is going to be difficult. The solution will be radical. Brother Jason and I went preaching in South Texas in prison. And, well, and then we also went to North Texas in prison. We've been a few places. And one of the signs that you see over and over is new places, new faces. After being in prison, you'd think you'd want to get out and go see your friends. You'd want to go back to those places that you're familiar with, that you're comfortable with. No, when you get out of the pen, you need to get a fresh start. You need to stay away from everything that's familiar to you. You need to go somewhere that is altogether different around people who never would condone of your previous. That's our problem sometimes. We got mamas and grandmamas that will condone just about anything. And then when you go to the pen, they try to make that a pleasant experience as much as possible. It ought to be miserable. You're like, yeah, you've never been to prison. Praise God. I have been in prison. Preaching. 
When I was 21, I was on my way to the pen. By the time I was in my early 30s, I was preaching in prisons. God's just good, guys. And I'm telling you, it is radical. I'm telling you, breaking up with a girlfriend, never answering a pager again, uh, just never, ever going around anybody again. It's hard not to answer when, you, when somebody's on, on a pager that, that was, it, it was like this size. And it had numbers on the top. And it, you get that, fo- it was back when we knew people's phone numbers. We didn't just type in the first three initials of their name. Somebody's phone number in your, that's so-and-so. And they'd type 911, 911, 911. And I knew that they needed me. But I also knew that if I went and helped them, that I'd go back and I'd end up in prison. And I had to let them deal with their problem while I was dealing with my problem. I had to deal with me, stand or fall. And I had to keep my promise to the Lord. And I knew the Lord did not want me to return that phone call. Some solutions are radical. And thirdly, some people won't like it. Verse 14 through 17. When the people came... They that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And when they came to Jesus to see him and, and see him that was possessed of the devil that had had, and had the legion sitting. They'd never seen him sitting down before. He was running, screaming, cutting himself, bloodied, scarred, naked. Naked. Running among the tombs, naked, dressed only in his own blood. Clothed and in his right mind. It says, and they were afraid. Can you imagine? You come up and they're like, hey man, we heard. <gasps> That's him. He's like, um, hey Mike, how you doing? I guess they're where they're at. He's like, hey Moisha, how you doing? And uh, said they were afraid. Now they came to Jesus says, and they that saw it told them how it befell to him that they were possessed of the devil and concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. Can you imagine? There's a guy in town, listen, he, he has mental illness and, and a lot of problems. His name is Larry and he's got one arm. And, and it's not a clean cut. It's, it's, he has a flap like the hole down to here and it just flops around and some people they, they don't know his name they call him Stompin' Steve and, and all that his name is Larry and I don't know what happened in Larry's life I don't know him that well I just know of him and uh, but we've seen him walk along and he'll and kick and kick and kick and scream and yell at people he's been thrown out of about every business in town and he gets arrested from time to time, and police will run him off, and some people help him, they buy him food, which is the right thing to do. You try to help and all that. But can you imagine going and, if you're from Grand Prairie, who, just by a show of hands, who all knows who I'm talking about? I see a lot of people who, who lived here. And, and you, if you were to drive to downtown Grand Prairie today, and he's always just wearing like a pair of shorts and nothing else. Body all scarred up, arm just flipping, flopping around and all that. Can you imagine driving down there and there's Larry wearing a pair of khakis and, you know, polo all tucked in, still got the one arm. And if he's like, hey, how you doing? And they're like, is that you stomping, Steve? And he's like, ah, you know, I'm not really stomping anymore. <clears throat> God did a work in my life. You wouldn't want to be like, oh, get out of here, man. He's like, I, you know what, I... I got to go, um, I got to go, go to work, I got a job. If God put that man back together and he had all of his faculties about him, what a hallelujah that would be. But instead, they're like, um, Jesus, can you get out of here? 
They were so afraid that God was doing something. Can I tell you, some people are happy in their mess. Why would you want a man running around naked, bleeding all over the place, screaming day and night? They, they didn't have windows that shut up tight. They didn't have, you know, central heat and air that kind of drowns out music. They didn't have Alexa playing music at night so they could sleep. And No, they would have heard him all, oh, oh, off in the distance. They'd have heard him wailing and screaming in the nights in the tombs. And they can't even give God glory right here. They can't even give God glory. They're afraid. You would think they'd be happy for him. Can I tell you guys, I don't know what you got going on in your life that you need help with. But if you allow God to help you, let me, let me warn you ahead of time. It's probably going to cost you some friends. Because they're going to get weirded out. They're going to get weirded out. You'll have people avoid you for no reason. You never did anything wrong to them. You're just trying to deal with your problems. You quit drinking and so all of a sudden, oh, you don't want to party anymore. You're just, come on, man. I just don't want to be a drunk. I don't want to get high anymore. I don't want to lose my family. I don't want to lose my life. You may have to change where and how you do business in your life. Let me, let me say this. Some people are so uncomfortable with God doing something really big in your life that they would rather see you be miserable forever. And I hate that, but I promise you it's true. They'll accuse you of thinking you're better than them. They'll accuse you of leaving them behind. They'll accuse you of faking it. Oh, you'll be back. Oh, you'll be back. Some people are so uncomfortable with God doing something really big in your life that they'd rather see you miserable forever. But can I tell you, it's worth it to let God do something in your life. It's a testimony for you. It's a testimony for the Lord. It's a great testimony. Let, let me encourage you. Let God do something big in your life. We didn't read it yet, but let's read verses 18 through 20 and we'll close. Jesus is leaving out now. People wanted him to go. He said, why don't you get out of here, man? And in verse 18... And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Can I go with you, Lord? Can I just get out of here? If they don't love you, they don't love me. Let me go with you, Lord. I, I, I want to go with you. I'll, I'll be one of your disciples now. Can I just stay with you? No. Jesus had a better plan. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not. But said unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed, and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Later, when Jesus comes back into that area of Decapolis, he picks up healing. And people are excited to come to him. Hey, can I tell you, people might not be excited at first when God does something in your life. But later, when the reality of their own problems happens, when the reality of their own problems come full into focus in their eyes, they'll want to hear you then. They'll want to know how it happened. They want to know how you got a hold of God. They want to know how God did something in your life. Because ultimately, when we all come to our senses, we want God to do something in our lives. Some problems, we need to suck it up. We need to introduce a vegetable and get rid of some snacks. We need to 
figure out how to quit smoking. We need to quit drinking. We need to quit cussing. We need to quit being rude to people. We need to learn to forgive people. We need to learn to be kind. Those things are within us, most of them. But there are some things that are beyond our own capabilities. And friend, there is nothing wrong with asking the Lord to help. In the end, it'll be a great testimony for you, and it'll be a great testimony for the power of God in your life. Let him have his way with thee. Now, if you can fix it yourself, fix it. Everybody needs a helping hand, and God attached one to the end of each of your arms. Help yourself. But if you can't, be honest enough. Don't give up. Ask the Lord to help you. Amen? All right, let's all stand. If you belong to him, God wants what's best for his children. If you're a child of God, allow him to help you. If you're not saved, if you're not a child of God, friend, won't you please allow the Lord to save you. Let me show you in the Bible how to be saved. How to know that you know that you know that heaven's your home. And if you are saved, let God help you. He wants to. He wants to help you. He loves to answer prayer, but he'll never answer a prayer we refuse to pray. As we go to invitation, that's what it is. It's an invitation. You're invited to come. Let me show you in the Bible how to be saved. You're invited to come and ask the Lord to help you. You're, you're, you're invited to come and just pray and thank God for helping you. Maybe come and pray and ask God to let you help somebody else. Just an invitation. You're invited. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word and your work in our lives. And Lord, I just pray that you'd have your hand on us, that you'd use us for your honor and for your glory. And Father, before we think about lunch, we just want to think about our situation with you. We want to be right. Not opinion right, but Bible right. Lord, thank you for being so powerful. And thank you for helping us with your strength. Your strength is made perfect in our weakness. When we realize we can't, that's a wonderful place to get you involved. Lord, we love you and we just thank you for it all. Please be with this invitation time in Jesus' name.